myself, how many points do I have? Would you be asking yourself, do you have any tools that might help you make this decision? There we go. So we have some people on both sides of the issue. What's interesting is that there is a tool that's available that might help you. And that tool is called losing trick count. Losing trick count is another method of hand evaluation that comes up after a fit has been established. With losing trick count, it gives you another method of hand evaluation. For instance, if you weren't sure as to whether or not you should bid over four spades, you could consult losing trick count and you could decide from that. Partner has forced a game over your simple response, as many people have noted. That typically shows a hand that has five losers or fewer. As some people seem to count, this hand has seven losers. The magic number in losing trick count is 24. This hand should be strong enough for you to bid again. If you weren't sure if you were strong enough to bid again, what I'm hoping to do today is I'm hoping to give you a tool that can help you. Now, this tool should not be your primary hand evaluation method. This should simply be something that you use when you're not sure if you know what to do. You should lo use losing trick count only once a fit has been established, and you should never use it prior to a fit being established. Okay, sorry, I had a slight technical difficulty there. Okay, so prior to a fit being found, high card points are widely considered to be the best and easiest method of hand evaluation. When playing no trump contracts, using high card points is still a pretty successful method for determining the best level to play at. But once a fit has been discovered, high card points may not be the best method for determining the level to play at. For instance, one method says you should add five points for a void and three points for a singleton and one point for a doubleton. But there's another common method out there, which is much more complicated. 
I'm going to read this to you just so you can see how complicated it really is. It, this method suggests that you add your high card points in a traditional way. Then you count your underrated honors, which are your aces and your tens. Then you count your overrated honors, which are your queens and your jacks. Then you subtract the smaller from the larger. Then you consider the difference and make an adjustment. After you've done that, you next have to consider your doubletons. You have to make an adjustment for a dubious doubleton and a singleton for a quality suit and length. I consider that method to be far too complicated. It doesn't make bridge fun. What I want is an extremely simple method which will give me a relatively accurate idea of the potential for a hand. And that is where losing trick count comes in. So take your hand that I've given you right here. Your partner has opened one heart. And it's your turn to respond. What would you respond with this hand? Go ahead and type in your answers. Let's see what everybody has to say. Okay, I see that the majority of people favor a bid of two hearts. However, there are some people that would bid one spade and one heart and one no trump. Well, let me give you the answer visually. Let's say that you were to bid one spade. Your next bid would be two hearts if partner were to rebid two clubs. Do you think that this is the hand partner is going to expect you to hold when you bid two hearts? The answer to that question should be obvious. No. Partner is going to play you to have a simple preference. Partner is going to play you to have maybe only a doubleton heart. Partner will not expect you to have three hearts for this auction. So because of that, you can't respond one spade. You should raise partner immediately. Let's consider counting losers and how we count losers. Well, it, and to, to respond to one question, I want you to type your questions in. Why not bid one spade and find out if you have a 4-4 four, four spade fit? Well, that may be great, but the problem is you can't afford to bid one spade when you have this shape because you're going to lose your 5-3 heart spit. Partner is never going to understand that you had three hearts. So while you might like to bid one spade, you shouldn't. You should raise to two hearts. Okay, but let's start with how we would count our losers. You count one loser for each card in a suit with a maximum of three losers per suit. So if you have a three card or longer suit, you count one loser for any card that is not the ace, the king, or the queen. In spades, you have four cards in the suit and you're missing the ace and the queen, so that would be two losers. In hearts, you have a three card suit, you're missing all the ace, the king, and the queen, therefore that would be three losers. In clubs, you're missing the ace, but not the king. And since you only have a doubleton, you would only count the ace and the king. So you're missing one loser in clubs, and then you're missing three losers in diamonds. You're missing the ace, the king, and the queen. So this is a total of nine losers. If you have a two-card suit, you count one loser for any card that is not the ace or the king. 
And if you have a singleton, you count one loser if it's not the ace. With a void, you don't count any losers at all. Now we'll get to some more examples in just a moment of how many losers are going to be with each step. But before we go to that, I want to give you some practice counting losers. Hopefully this will be a review for some people, but if it's not, then bear with me. Okay, go ahead and count the losers in the south hand and tell me how many losers that you come up with. And be aware, I'm going to go back to some other hands, but I want to try to go step by step. Excellent. Five losers is correct. In five losers, you have none in spades, you have one in hearts, you have three in diamonds, and you have one in clubs for a total of five. Okay, very good. Let's move on. How many losers in the West Hand? Okay, excellent. The West Hand has six losers. There are two in spades. You're missing the ace and the king. There are two in hearts. You're missing the king and the queen. There is one in diamonds. You're missing the ace. And there is one in clubs. So that's two and two plus one plus one is six losers total. Okay, we'll do two more examples of this. In the north hand, we have two losers in spades, one loser in heart, two losers in diamonds, and three losers in clubs. That's eight total losers. And finally, in the east hand, two losers in spades, two losers in heart, two losers in diamonds, and two losers in clubs. Eight total losers. Note that both the north hand and the east hand both have eight losers, yet there's a significant difference in high card point strength. So this method of evaluation is a very different method. Do you have any questions about any of these four hands and the losers that I counted in any of these four hands? Okay, to give you an idea of the strength of opening hands and the like, uh, I want you to know that you do not use losing trick count or the number of losers that you have to decide whether or not to open a hand. Losing trick count is only used once a fit has been discovered. So when you choose to open a hand, we typically use the rule of 20 
or perhaps the rule of 20 plus 2 or whatever method you're currently using to decide. But once you get to the point where you have opened the hand and discovered a fit, you can consider how good your opening hand was. And we say that seven losers are considered to be a minimum opening hand. If you have six losers, you have a good opening hand. If you have five losers, that hand should be strong enough to force game if partner is able to respond and you find a fit. And finally, if you have four losers or fewer, you can definitely force game. And in fact, you might have considered opening two clubs. Four losers or fewer is an extremely good hand. And then looking at the responder. Let's say that you're the responder and you discover a fit immediately because your partner has opened one of a major and you have a fit for her. If you have 10 or more losers, typically you should pass or maybe give a preemptive raise with four card support. Sometimes with three card support, you might give a delayed raise. If you have nine losers, that's considered to be a simple raise strength. You may have either three or four card support for that. If you have eight losers, that's considered a limit raise strength. You might also have either three or four card support for that, but obviously a direct limit raise promises four card support. If you have seven losers, that should be a game forcing hand. You shouldn't give op partner the option of passing below game. If you have six losers, you should think that's a slam invitational hand. If partner has a good hand, you might have slam. And if you have five losers, you should know immediately that you're in the slam zone. Now think about how powerful that is. Partner just opened the bidding, and yet you, from one initial hand evaluation, should know that you might be in the slam zone, or that you know you should gain force and that you shouldn't just invite. That can be a very, very powerful method of hand evaluation. And specifically, the magic number for basic losing trick count is 24. You start with 24, you subtract the losers in your hand, and you subtract the losers you're estimating in your partner's hand from the initial 24. That will give you a total of the number of tricks you can expect to take. If you're in a major and that total is 10, you could expect to make game. Now I've told you that if you have seven losers, you should game force. So think about that math for a moment. Our magic number is 24. Partner opened the bidding, so we expect partner to have seven losers. We have seven losers ourselves. We add our 7 to partner 7, we get 14. We subtract 14 from 24, and we get 10. Our expectation is that we're going to make 10 tricks. Therefore, we should force game. Hopefully, that will make sense. Okay, I've gone back to an earlier example so I can show you a little bit more about how losing trick count works. Partner opens one heart. Now put yourself in the north position. Partner raised to two hearts. It may seem obvious to you simply to pass based on your balanced hand and your 14 high card points. But before you do that, you should at least give losing trick count some consultation, since you have now found a fit. You have two losers in spades, one in hearts is three, three in diamonds is six, and one in clubs is seven. Since you have seven losers, you should definitely pass. Partner made a simple raise. For partner's simple raise, you expect nine losers. Now you add those two together. You have seven. Your partner has 9, that's 16. 24 minus 16 equals 8. You should expect 8 tricks on the hand, and therefore you should pass 2 hearts. Right now, again, 
I think that you should use losing trick count only as a tool when you are not sure what to do. When you're sure what to do, you should go ahead and do it. I see various questions about people asking about losing trick count with now with today's lighter openings. Again, you don't, don't open the bidding based on losing trick count. And we still consider an opening bid to be seven losers. When people are opening lighter today, they are opening lighter based on their shape. And you'll find that shapely hands have significantly fewer losers than balanced hands. So this should not. The number 24 is a magic number. It's going to take a long time for me to explain it, so that's why I just call it a magic number. I leave you to do the research on your own to see where the magic number of 24 came up with. Okay, time to move on. Partner has opened one heart. We have responded two hearts. And now partner bids three diamonds. In simple English, what does the three diamond bid say? If you're talking in simple English, the three diamond bid should say, Please reevaluate your hand for hearts and diamonds and decide whether or not to bid game. If you do reevaluate your hand for hearts and diamonds, how does your hand fit with partner? In this case, it should fit very poorly with partner. Only one of your eight high card points is in the two suits that partner cares about. In the other suits, you have kings. Those kings may or may not be valuable to partner, but they're certainly not going to be as valuable as aces. So your hand fits very poorly with partner. You should probably just try to sign off and bid three hearts. In this situation, I don't think that you need to use losing trick count. Again, I'm recommending that you use losing trick count only when you're unsure what to do. Here, with such a poorly fitting hand, I recommend that you simply bid three hearts. Let's look at the North hand for a moment. North still only had 13 high card points. North thought about and, in fact, decided to invite with game. Why would North invite game with only 13 high card points? Well, part of it had to do with losing trick count. That singleton club might have been a very valuable card. When you consider the number of losers that the opener had, two in spades, one in hearts, two in diamonds, and one in clubs. That was only six losers. Six losers was worth an invite. So opener decided to invite. Again, if opener had had seven losers, we consider that to be a minimum opening hand. Opener probably wouldn't invite. But it's okay to invite with six losers. Take okay, questions about this or I'll move on.
you've opened one heart and partner has bid three hearts. Three hearts is a limit raise. Should you accept this limit raise or should you pass? Well, I would accept this limit raise and I would bid gain. Now, there are several reasons that you can. If you're not sure if you think this is a 13 count and you're not sure if you should accept it or not, one thing you might do is you might go to your toolbox, your toolbox which includes losing trick count. Partner's limit raise shows eight losers. So you have two in spades and one in hearts is three and two in diamonds is five and one in clubs is six. You have six losers. Partner's eight and you're six, that equals 14. 24 minus 14 equals 10. We should have 10 tricks, that should be enough for game. So we should accept game. And again, use this tool only when you're not sure what to do. I think this hand was close as to whether or not you should accept the limit raise and bid game. Therefore, I went to my toolbox. Game is an excellent contract in the place that you're supposed to be. Let's go to a bidding challenge hand next. What should you bid? Partner has raised your one spade bid to two spades. Well, it's interesting. With your 15 high card points, you might think about inviting game. You might be unsure as to what to do. Should you invite game maybe with a three diamond bid? Should you bid three spades? You might be unsure as to what to do. So this is a fine time to consult losing trick count. Losing trick count says you have one loser in spades, one loser in hearts, two losers in diamonds, and one loser in clubs. That's five losers. Partner, for partner's simple raise, should have nine losers. Nine losers in partner's hand and five in yours equals 14. The magic number of 24 minus 14 equals 10. That suggests that you have game. Therefore, you should bid game. But let's assume for a moment that you don't bid game, that you're still unsure of yourself. What you should do is you should invite game. And by inviting game, you'd bid three diamonds. So put yourself in the north position. Now partner has opened a spade, you've bid two spades, partner has invited with three diamonds. Should you accept this three diamond invitation? Or should you decline this three diamond invitation and sign off? Please feel free to answer. Okay. 
everybody is saying yes, they would accept this game invitation. Accept this game invitation. I didn't see one person who would not bid game. So let's look at losing trick count for a moment. If you look at losing trick count, you have three losers in spades, three losers in hearts, one loser in diamonds, and three losers in clubs. That's ten losers. Ten losers says, oh, no, you should not accept game. Ten losers says that you should simply sign off in three spades. But remember, you should use losing trick count only when you feel unsure as to what to do. If partner invited with three diamonds, I would say to myself, gee, I have four spades for my two spade bid when I may have only had three, and I have all of my points in diamonds and spades. Therefore, I would never bother consulting losing trick count. I would simply look at my hand, and I would know what to do. So I would bid four spades. I only consult losing trick count when I'm unsure as to what to do. Okay, questions about this example, or shall I move on? I see a question about how do you evaluate losers in a fit suit. In a fit suit, I'm assuming that each side has three, so you count losers normally. The beauty of losing trick count is that it's one number as an estimation of the entire hand. It counts your distribution. It counts your honors. It counts everything in one simple number. Okay, I'll move on. I see an excellent question. Does this work with a 4-3 fit? No. We recommend an 8-card fit at least before you consult losing trick count. So partner has opened one club. You've responded a spade. And partner has jumped to four hearts. Four hearts promises spade support. If a splinter bid is a convention that's beyond your grasp, Simply imagine that partner bids four spades in this situation and try to decide what to do there. How many losers do we expect partner to have for his splinter bid? The answer to that question is five or fewer. If partner had more than five, partner would only invite game. Partner would not force game unless they had five or fewer. So I'm not sure if I have a slam or not. I think maybe I have a slam. Uh, I have one loser in spades and two in hearts and three in diamonds and one in clubs. That's seven. I know that my seven losers plus partner's five losers, that equals 12. The magic number of 24 minus 12 equals 12. Therefore, we should be in the slam zone. Now, many of you may be worried that partner has does not have the ace or king of diamonds. I promise you that without going into too much detail, if you think about it, you could prove that partner must have either the ace or the king of diamonds, unless partner is void in heart. So I think that there is enough detail to go and to bid on and to try for a slam. Also, if you evaluate the location of your honors, you don't have anything wasted in hearts or diamonds. It's not like you're looking at the queen jack of hearts or the queen jack of diamonds. You don't have anything wasted. And in the suits that partners cares about, you have great honors. 
You even have a fifth spade. So let's say that you bid for no trump. Partner bow bids five hearts. Five hearts promises two aces, and it also denies the queen of spades. What bid should you make next? I see one person suggest five no trump, but let's hear a couple of opinions. Okay, uh, you do have all of the key cards though. So, right, if partner has two, we have three. So we have all the key cards. I think the real question is gonna be between five no trump and six spades. Why would five no trump be a good bid? Or should we just bid six spades? Well, the correct bid turns out to be five no trump. Five no trump guarantees all the key cards and is itself a grand slam invitation. Many people say it asks for kings, but that is incorrect. Five no trump does not ask for kings. Five no trump guarantees all the key cards and invites opener to bid or invites partner to bid a grand slam. Only if partner is not able to bid a grand slam, then they would show kings up the line. So don't think of five no trump as a king asking bid. It is not. Five no trump guarantees all the key cards and invites partner to bid a grand slam. Only if partner is unable to bid the grand slam should they go back and show kings. So look what happens. Take a moment and think about why partner was able to bid seven spades over five no trump. When you guaranteed all the key cards, all of a sudden partner could evaluate their hand in a different way. Right? Partner said to themselves, I think I'm going to try to count tricks. How many tricks do I have? Well, partner counted five spade tricks. One heart is six. One diamond is seven and six clubs are 13. How did partner count five spade tricks? You only promised four. Think about that. If you're looking at the hand from the position of north, how could you count five spade tricks? That's correct. North would assume that you would be able to trump one heart in the dummy. That's how North counts five spade tricks. They, they have a singleton. It's unlikely that you have a singleton also. The opponents never bid. The opponents never preempted in hearts. If you had a singleton also, they would have 11 between them. Surely somebody would have bid. So it's extremely likely that you're going to be able to trump one heart in the dummy, at least. Therefore, you can count five spade tricks, one heart, one diamond, and six clubs. The question, does five no trump guarantee the queen of trumps? The answer to that question is yes, it does. Five no trump guarantees the queen of trumps. 
I see the questions coming. Again, remember that five no Trump is a grand slam ask invite because if you didn't have the queen of Trump, you wouldn't be interested in a grand slam, right? You'd either have so many spades that the queen of Trump didn't matter, or if you didn't have it, you wouldn't want to bid a grand slam missing the queen of Trump. Okay. And if you look at, it looks like B-N-R-A-J, they have an excellent question, which you should consider. It's going to take a lot of time, but I promise you, if you think about the losers and you take the time and study on your own, you'll see that partner has to have either the ace or king of diamonds. It's not possible. It's not a novice question, but it's going to take a long time to explain. So I'm going to leave that to, your, to yourself. Okay, are we ready to move on? Okay, partner has opened one spade, and it's your turn to bid. Please feel free to type in your response. You might count your 10 high card points, and you might say that I have four card support and 10 high card points, therefore I should make a limit raise. But if you think about your 10 high card points, these are not a great 10 high card points. These high card points are all scattered. This is a great time when you're right on the border, and I'll tell you that there's two high card point hands totals that are the most difficult. Those are 10 high card point hands and 12 high card point hands. And the reason being is that with 10 high card points, sometimes it's right to make a simple response. Sometimes it's right to make a limit response. And with 12 high card points, sometimes it's right to make a limit response. And sometimes it's right to force gain. So those are the two uh, number of high card point hands, which are by far the most difficult to handle as responder. So with this 10 high card point hands, I think it's very reasonable. Uh, and I see questions about Bergen. Uh, this is, those are great questions. I'm going to handle Bergen a little bit later. So for now, I'm going to say no Bergen. Uh, but I promise you that there's something coming about Bergen. And I see Eliza's comment. talks about four triple three. One of the great things about losing trip count is it handles all of your distribution in that one simple number. And yes, because you're four triple three, you happen to have more losers. You'll see balanced hands have more losers. Unbalanced hands have fewer losers. So it's such a great tool because it does combine into one nice simple number. So with this hand, 10 high card points, the key, 10 high card points. You have nine losers. This hand should be a simple raise. The correct bid with this hand is two spades. Okay, and Wyoming 3-3 has a good question. Do you count Queen X as two and a half losers? This is basically an introduction to losing trick count. So for this, it's going to be two losers only. Um, there, there are other losing trick count evaluation methods which you might consider. And if you're looking at all four hands, I'm sorry, it's supposed to be kibitzing south only.
You should be looking at the south hand only. I'm not sure why you're seeing multiple hands. I just wanted you to see one hand. Again, look only at the south hand. I simply filled in the other cards. Okay, the point of this is this is one hand with 10 high card points. I'm about to give you another hand with 10 high card points. Okay, here we have another 10 high card point hand. Partner has opened one spade. And it's our turn to bid. That's right. This hand has only eight losers. There are two in spades, two in hearts, one in diamonds, and three in clubs. Eight losers is a limit raise. So with this 10 high card point hand, we should make a limit raise. Again, think about that. Both hands had 10 high card points, yet one recommended a simple raise, one recommended a limit raise. This is the difference between, between straight point count and between having another tool on close hands, and that additional tool is losing trick count. Okay. Let me give you another hand. Everybody is okay with three spades on this one, I hope, right? I don't see anybody disputing it. Here we have a third 10 high card point hand. We might make a limit raise. Let's count up our losers. We have one in spades and one in hearts and one in diamonds and three in clubs. That's only six losers. What does six losers tell us? Should we bid three spades? That's right. Six losers tell us tells us that we should force game. Excellent. Now, I see a couple of people have suggested that two diamonds. If that's your thought, you should get that thought out of your head immediately. When you have four card support, you raise partner with some bid. Whether that bid be two no trump if that's what you play, or whether that bid be a splinter bid if that's what you play, or whether that bid be four spades if you don't play a splinter bid. Whatever it is, you should raise partner and you should force the game. If you bid two diamonds, you are denying four spades, in my opinion. You are, for lack of a better word, you're obfuscating the length of your spade suit. Okay, now, I certainly would recommend a splinter bid if you play them. If you don't play splinter bids yet, that's fine. If you don't play splinter bids, I recommend that you bid four spades. Just go right to game. Don't bid a limit. Don't give partner any chance to not to be able to pass. That's the problem. You don't want partner to pass below game. So if you couldn't have bid four hearts, I would recommend that you bid four spades. Okay, again, a 10 high card point hand that you should force game. So we had one 10 high card point hand with a simple raise, one 10 high card point hand that was a limit raise, and this 10 high card point hand was game forcing. Again, trying to show you that there may be better methods of reevaluating your hand after a fit has been discovered. Okay, let's show you all the hands here.
Now here, as it turns out, you may in fact make slam. It depends on what they lead. But whether or not you get to slam shouldn't be your focus. First of all, you have 12 high card points opposite 10. You're looking at 22 high card points. Probably not really in the slam zone. You might make a slam, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to miss game. That's what you really don't want to do. You don't want to miss game. And had you decided to make a limit raise, you might have taken the chance that you would miss game. So that would be the real problem. Okay? Whether or not you get to slam, whether or not you make slam, what you really want to focus on here is that you got to game. And if you didn't force game with the south hand, if you just bid three spades, then you might have missed game. Partner might have passed that limit raise. That's why you really got to force game when you have less. Now, someone asking me questions about being too strong for a splinter, I'm still hoping to get to that. So I'm going to leave that question, uh, but it's coming up also, I promise. I might run over by a few minutes so that I can continue um, on. That's right. North has eight. Eight losers. So North would never accept your limit raise bid. So you must force game with the south hand. Okay. Time to move on. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you hands that all have the same number of losers. These hands are all going to have seven losers. And I'm going to talk about the different ways sometimes that you handle hands with the same number of losers. Partner has opened one spade, and it's your turn to bid. Okay. Once again, just to handle Eliza 42's question, North has eight losers. Do I still open an eight-loser hand? Remember what we started with, a losing trick count. You don't use losing trick count until a fit has established. Never use losing trick count until a fit has been established. So when you're opening the bidding, no fit has been, therefore you use things like 12 high card point hands or the rule of 20 or whatever else you might use, that's what you do. Okay, with this hand, you have kind of a weak hand, but if you count your losers up, I'm pretty sure that you have seven losers. What do you want to make sure you do with seven losers? You want to make sure that you force game. That's right. Everybody's got it. Force game with seven losers. Now, I consider this to be a very weak high card point hand with my seven losers. So therefore, with this particular hand, I would recommend that you bid four spades. Okay? And to B Tor's comment, uh, there is a law of total tricks bid, but I'm not considering the law of total tricks when I'm bidding to make. Um, I only consider the law of total tricks when I'm preempting. So in this scenario, you can bid to make with anything that you want if you think you're going to make it. So therefore, seven losers, we bid four spades. Partner knows that we have a weakish hand as far as our high card points go, but that we have a small enough number of losers that we have a chance to make it. Okay, next example. Again, this next example is going to also have seven losers. What might we do with this hand? 
two, two losers in spades, one in hearts is three, one in diamonds is four, and three in clubs is seven. Here what's happened, though, is our strength has gone up, right? We now have 13 high card points. This, in my opinion, is a hand which is a textbook splinter. If you don't play splinters, just make sure that you make a game-forcing bid. This, this hand is my, my ideal of a splinter. Okay, so now there could be another type of hand with seven losers. On this one, we have 15 high card points, but also seven losers. But as most people point out, yes, this is a hand. Okay, so what we've handled is sometimes you have the same number of high card points but a different number of losers. That can affect the way you approach a hand. And it's equally true to say that you might have the same number of losers but have different high card points and different shape, and you might make a different bid based on those as well. Okay, hopefully that, that got the message of those two things across very well. But to no trump is usually balanced unless you have a very strong hand, and I'll show you where you, have, you might have a very strong hand here in just a moment. Okay, so let's review the common conventions and how, what they show with respect to losing trick count. Okay, Jacoby to no trump, that shows seven or fewer losers with four card trump support. A splinter bid, that should be six or seven losers exactly and four card trump support. A one four jump bid, that should be seven losers exactly, a weak hand, with usually five card trump support, but it's also okay to do it with only four. A limit raise is eight losers exactly, and a simple raise is the most varied. It's nine losers with either three or four card support, but it can occasionally be eight to ten losers when you have only three card support. All right, Bergen raises. Now, I do not advocate for Bergen raises, but boy, are they spectacular with losing trick count. They fit right into losing trick count so incredibly well. They're a perfect match. In Bergen raises, 10 losers, that would be a preemptive raise. That would be an immediate 1-3 bid. In Bergen raises, if you had 9 losers, that would be weak Bergen, a 3-club bid. If you had 8 losers, that would be limit Bergen, a 3-diamond bid. So they met, they missed Sorry, they mesh with Bergen extremely well. Extremely well. And I see a question from Murphy's Law. How does the bidding continue? This hand is not a full hand. It's only designed to have you look at the south. So there's no continue bidding here. Okay, I'll repeat this. 
for people that like Bergen. Okay, if you like, if you don't like Bergen raises, then turn me on mute for a moment. Don't pay any attention to it. It is. If you have ten losers, you make an immediate one-three bid for a preemptive bid. If you have nine losers, I call that weak Bergen. That's one of a major past three club. If you have eight losers, that's a limit raise. A limit raise is one of a major past three diamonds. So using losing trick count with Bergen is very, very effective. They mesh very well together. Now, that being said, I'm not an advocate of Bergen raises. I don't play Bergen raises in my favorite partnership. I don't believe they're necessary. But if you like them and you do play them, losing trick count fits very, very well. Because the reason I don't like them is that I feel that they take up bidding space for other bids which are more frequent and occur more often. And so, therefore, I don't feel that I have the space to play Bergen. Okay, moving on. And just to the people, um, I want to, uh, uh, to the hosts and everything, I'm hoping that I can go over by 10 or 15 minutes here. I'm not quite done. I assume it's okay to go over, but I'm going to go over, so uh, just so you know. Now, let's consider how we might use losing trick count on the second round of the auction, okay? In this case, we open one club and our partner responds one spade. Again, we're looking at the south hand only. We said originally that once a fit has been established, we might look at losing trick count. So when we open the bidding, we didn't have a fit, but the partner has responded one spade, we do. So we consider our losing trick count. We have two in spades, two in hearts, two in diamonds, and one in clubs. That's seven losers. With seven losers, that's a minimum opening hand. So what do we bid with a minimum opening hand? Well, we just raise partner. Hopefully this will make sense. Right? If we have a little bit better than a minimum opening hand, that would be only six losers. Such as a hand like this. We have two losers in spades, two losers in hearts, one loser in diamond, and one loser in clubs. That's six losers. We said that six losers was an above average opening hand. With an above average opening hand, we tend to jump one round. So again, hopefully you're kind of seeing the beauty of having a tool in your tool belt that's a different evaluation method. And it, it just makes natural sense. If you open a club, partner bids a spade. If you have a minimum, you bid two spades. That's seven losers. If you have six losers, you bid three spades. If you have five losers, you bid four spades. It just makes sense, and it works. Okay. So let me show you one more example here.
here. One loser in spades, two in hearts, that's three. One in diamonds is four. One in clubs is five. That's a four spade bid. Okay. So we know quite a bit about losing trick count now and how to do it on the first round of the auction and a little bit how to do it on the second round of the auction. But let's consider, is there any other place that we might use losing trick count? We'll take a look at this example. This happened in a game, and it occurred to me that maybe I could do that, use it here too. I held the south hand. My left hand opponent opened one club. Partner made it to take out double. And my right hand opponent bid one heart. It seemed that everybody had a good hand. So I was saying to myself, gosh, my five high card points, I really don't know how much to bid. I just, I don't know. I think it's clearly too good for one spade, but I thought maybe two spades, maybe three spades, or maybe even four spades. I wasn't sure. So I was saying to myself, well, could I use losing trick count? Could this give me an estimation? For instance, did I know that we had at least an eight card fit in spades? I think the answer to that question is yes. Partners take out double promised support for all the unbid suits. Partner had to have at least three card support for spades for his take out double. So it was a situation where I was going to be able to use losing trick count because I knew that we had a fit. Then I said, well, let's see, how many losers could I estimate that partner had? Well, we know that a takeout double shows an opening hand. So without knowing exactly how many losers partner had, I gave partner an estimate of seven losers for their opening hand. That's a minimum opening bid, and that's what a takeout double shows, a minimum opening hand. So then I said, well, gee, I have two in spades, and two in diamonds, and two in clubs. That's only six losers. I bet I could bid game. So I did. So I used losing trick count in a scenario where you might not think it applies. But if you know that you have a fit, you know that you have at least the eight card uh, suit together, sometimes there will be situations where you, can lose, where you can use losing trick count just from an estimation of the bidding. And this was one of those times. Okay, this ends uh, the hands that I have presentation with. Uh, this ends the hands that I have for the presentation. Um, and so now just let's open it up for questions. Type in any question. As each question comes up, I'm going to go ahead and attempt to work it. Does this work with a bot? Well, this is a hand evaluation technique. So however you choose to evaluate your hands, it works the way you choose to evaluate your hands. What do I do when the opponents go to five hearts? That's a tougher question. On this hand, partner is going to double five hearts, so I'm going to allow partner to double. So I'm happy to let partner double five hearts. How does this losing trick count fit into competitive auctions when both sides are in the bidding? Well, losing trick count is a method to try to tell you approximately how many tricks you think you can take. Most of the time, you use law of total tricks when you're in a competitive auction to decide how high to bid, but this is an estimation of the number of tricks that your side can take. Next question, what if your partner doesn't do this? If your partner doesn't do this, then you certainly could uh, teach your partner, right? It's such a simple method. You count your losers. You estimate partner's losers from the bidding. You subtract the total from 24, and that gives you an idea. Again, when you teach your partner, make sure that you teach your partner. Don't use this as your primary evaluation method. This should simply be a tool when you're unsure as to what to do. Okay. Um, I assume that these notes are going to be posted on the Internet, so that one I think that you can do that. 
Next question, one spade, two spades, two no trump. Well, I like to use one spade, two spades, two no trump as uh, conventional. So that's a difficult question for me to answer. I'm going to pass on that question. But use it however you're using it. It shouldn't affect your losing trick count. Uh, is a singleton help with four trump? Yes. How does, lose, how does law of total tricks work with losing trick count? All right, they're different. And they're different in that law of total tricks is more about trying to help you how, try to help you how high it's safe to compete to. Right, law of total tricks is like a convent, is a competitive tool. Whereas losing trick count is supposed to be, the idea is supposed to be that you have an estimation of how many tricks your side can take. So when you go law of total tricks, you might go down, but you're accepting that you might go down and that the amount you're going to go down is less than what the opponents could have made. Whereas with losing trick count, you're still trying to give yourself more an estimation of what you might make. So they're different. Okay. Can you reevaluate queens on bidding by opponents? Yes. You should always reevaluate based on bidding by opponents. Queens in the opponent's suit are not good. Question, does losing trick count work with a 6-2 fit? Yes, but with a 6-2 fit, the person with two cards should assume they have three cards in spades and add one loser to their hand. So it's kind of based on the idea that both sides have at least three cards. So you can use it, but the person with the two-card support needs to add one loser to their hand. All right. Any other questions? You got me for another six minutes. If we're done with losing trick count questions, I'll be happy to take questions about whatever. Oh, let me promote real fast. Sorry. Um, I have a bridge app. It's an education and teaching app, and I should definitely. My app uh, helps, it helps you practice bridge. So it lets you um, bid practice hands with your partner. Um, it lets you read articles from Mike Lawrence and Eddie Cantar. And it lets you play bidding challenge hands from all over the country. Uh, if you want to, I, I gave my email address. Uh, I do a lot of speaking at the NABCs and at ACBL regionals when I travel throughout the country. Uh, if you liked me, by all means, please tell the people here on BBO that you thought I did a good job, and um, you can get another piece of me uh, if you get my app. Um, I do teaching stuff on my app a lot. Uh, I hope that you learn. Okay, next question, though. Uh, if opponents bid suit to my right and I have king or queen, do I adjust loser count? Answer to that question, no. Your loser count is basically the idea is that it's one simple number that gives you an entire estimation of your hand. So no, you don't. One thing that you might do with that is that uh, you might um, consider bidding no trump rather than bidding your eight-card major fit. If you have, say, king, queen, third, you might eschew your eight-card major suit fit. You might try three no trump. That would be something different. I'm being asked a question in, pri in private, which I think is a great question. It says, Has I, have I ever appeared at an ABA national? Uh, the ABA is the American Bridge Association, and I have a wonderful story. When I was 14, that was 30 years ago now, I'm 44. When I was 14, I went to an ABA nationals in Washington, D.C., and I finished second. I was super excited. They gave me a trophy that was like seven feet tall, and my father – chose to take the $5 cash prize rather than taking this gigantic trophy. And I'll tell you what, when I was 14 years old, I had that trophy. That was the most amazing thing. So the answer is yes, I have appeared at an ABA National. I would love to go back to another ABA National. Um, and, uh, and the ABA is a great organization, and I uh, certainly recommend it. How you can get my app, you can go to the website, which I listed, www.bridgeiqplus, all spelled out. And there's buttons right there. They'll take you to it.
There will be a window. There will be an Android version um, later this summer. I'm working on it every chance I get. I hope, as I said, if you liked it today, if you had a good time, please tell uh, the members here, whether that be uh, Diana, who is instrumental in getting me to come, um, but tell her that you liked it. Well, thank you. Thank, thanks to BBO. Um, yes, I should be promoting a little bit, a little bit more stuff. Um, I do. If you ever play an ACBL game um, at clubs, I do the commentary for the Tuesday games, uh, and you can see my commentary on Tuesday games for the common game. Uh, I do them every Tuesday. If you don't know what the common game is, you can learn more about that at www thecommongame.com. Okay. Um, I distinguish raises without Bergen by simply making a simple raise, and then if the opponents compete, then I further compete to three. That would be when the law of total tricks came in. Okay. So I go based more on the losing trick count in my high card points than I care about forcing myself to the three level. The last thing I really want to do is, uh, so let's say I bid weak Bergen. Great, I have nine losers and partner has seven. That's we're too high. That's sixteen losers. So we're too high. So I don't really want to play a convention where great, I automatically find out that I've gotten too high. It just doesn't make sense to me. Okay? That's all I can say. I don't think it's a great convention to play. I understand that it's simple and easy and a lot of people understand it and a lot of people like it, and that's fine. If you like it and play it, I don't recommend that you stop. But, you know, um, it is what it is. I don't particularly care for it. Uh, the name Griffo, uh, it comes from my first business was a bar called Griffin's, and I run a, I'm, I live in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I have a bridge club here that I'm part owner of, which is called the Griffin's Bridge Club. Um, so it's just something that's been with me for, you know, 25 years, and uh, I've just always been Griffo to a lot of people. <laughs> 